Welcome back, Day Camp friends, to the Day Camp Podcast. I'm Andy Pritikin, Director of Liberty Lake in the Philly suburbs of New Jersey. I'm Sam Thompson from Crystal Lake Park District, Northwest of Chicago. And we are dedicating this episode to Aaron Gluckstein in the Great White North, who is fighting flu-like symptoms. So we are Day Camp day, uh, Professional Joining Forces to provide a forum for summer camp pros like you to share ideas and best practices across North America and beyond. So for today's podcast, we are joined by Mark Hemmerdinger from Crestwood Country Day Camp in Long Island, Ryan Rosen from Camp Kinneret, just north of Los Angeles, and um, well, we got Jonathan from, he's the founder and current CEO of Camp Canada Inc., which is the only Canadian based and longest operating international camp staffing agency in Canada. So we're going to be discussing all the challenges of recruiting staff to work at day camp, which is similar to recruiting staff for pretty much anywhere um, nowadays. So, you know, this, it's, it seems like it wasn't that long ago, the recession hit and everybody was like, oh, well, you know, it's a, uh, <laughs> it's it's no problem getting staff it's just hard getting kids right and it seemed like there was like a glut and then it sort of like turned overnight and and you know what was happening it, it wasn't just a whim it was a combination of forces you have the fact that with the whole baby boom and the boomlet that we're like in between one of those things right now so there's actually less um potential you know less candidates out there anyway especially if you're talking about high school and college uh kids and then on top of that the recession, what it did um, was create a whole new economy kind of thing. And now there, there's actually less, pe less percentage of high school and college kids in the workforce. They say that only 30% of eligible high school and college kids are even in the workforce. So think about it. We've got a smaller pool of fish and then only 30% of those fish would even consider working at our camp, right? And uh, and that's a bummer when you're uh, when you're Mark Hammerding or Crestwood and you have to hire how many people? Four hundred. Four hundred, just four hundred people. So you know, whatever. So uh, Mark, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself and Crestwood? All right. Well, I started a long time ago as a Crestwood camper, um, and uh, went to sleepaway camp. <laughs> Fell in love with everything camp as a as a sleepaway camp counselor at a camp called Trails End, which is still a great camp um and then got into the day camp world where i met andy uh had a, we had some great summers uh some great times and uh about 20 years ago came back to be at crestwood which um is a very large camp in the suburbs of uh new york city long island um we have um anywhere from uh about 1200 give or take uh, campers per day. We have over 400 staff. Uh, we have campers that age and range, uh, uh, range from about two years old till about 16. Um, and um, and I would say we're on the um, higher price side of uh, the camp world. I think that's kind of the niche that we uh, we have for ourselves. Right. And an interesting thing about Crestwood, it's in an area on Long Island where a lot of kids end up going to resident camp afterwards, just sort of graduate and go to resident camp. So um, there is a ton of preschoolers there, right? And right. first and second graders, right? So right. would you say that it's that even more than half the camp is between like ages three and seven, right? I would say that two thirds of the camp is probably, yeah, probably seven, seven, eight and under, seven and under. Wow. Think about that. That is a lot of little kids roaming yeah. around. On how many acres? We have about 15 acres. That's pretty cool. All right. So we're going to be, uh, we're going to be delving into the brain of, of when you have to hire mass amounts of people, like my man Mark there. All right. So now I want to travel across the country, five and a half hours, all the way to sunny L.A. Or just north of L.A. Ryan Rosen, unmute yourself. And introduce yourself. I am, about I am here. <laughs> uh, thanks for having me here today. Uh, good to be here. Uh, so we are uh, camp. This will be our 66th summer here. Um, this will be my 25th here at Canaret. And uh, we have uh, roughly 325 kids a day. Uh, we have a staff of about 70 to 75. And uh, we are all outdoors in our geographic area. Within about 20 miles of us, there's probably 50 other camps. Um, so we have a lot of camps in a very small area, 
and uh, so we have some different challenges. But uh, our property is quite lovely. We're uh, just back up the Santa Monica Mountains, and we have about 109 acres in total that we're on. We only use about probably 15 to 20 of it, though. Right. So a couple of interesting things. So if anyone's ever been to LA and you've been down at the beach, like, you know, Santa Monica or whatever, and you look north, you see those beautiful mountains. That is where Orion spends his summers up there. And which is really nice yeah. as long as there's no forest fires coming your way or brush fires. That's right. We were, we were right in the path of the Woolsey fire two years ago. It was on our property. They were doing airdrops on our property. So we were right in the thick of it. Uh, Unbelievable. Ago, not sure that we would exist. So. Yeah. And also, That'd you know, some, yeah. something we're going to touch on, as, as New Jersey, my camp is creeping towards the $15 minimum wage. Uh, Los Angeles County went up to 15 first, like out of anybody. So Ryan's been dealing yes. with that. <laughs> yeah, that is, that's been a fun challenge. Uh, and we've got some other stuff going on out here uh, related to labor and uh, right now that we're dealing with as well. So a lot happening on the staffing front. Very interesting. Um, all right, and let's let's shift up to Canada now. The, it's like it, it's almost like Aaron planned this, right? He's like, I won't I won't be there, but I'll have a, a Canadian stand-in. So, so, Jonathan, tell us about yourself and, and Camp Canada. Hey, thanks so much. Happy to be here. Um, calling from the Great White North. We got lots of snow. Um, appreciate, uh, yeah, you put me on here, and hope Aaron, you feel better. So, I am originally uh, from the U.S. Uh, grew up in Michigan. And um, my grandmother had a cottage in Ontario. So I got the ship up here for the summers and sort of going to day camp when I was very young at a camp just north of Toronto. Um, loved it, fell in love with camp, fell in love with camping. Um, worked at a number of camps across Ontario, primarily overnight camps, as well as camps in California and Australia. And uh, fell in love at camp, ended up moving uh, to Toronto to be with my uh, girlfriend, now wife and um, realized that camps in Canada were struggling with finding mature professional staff and um, both day and overnight camps. So about 14 years ago, we started a business to help uh, provide staffing services, international staffing services for camps across Canada. Uh, it's called Camp Canada Inc. And um, it's been a phenomenal experience. We work with camps all across the country, um, support, over 2,000 uh, participants a year with a variety of different types of services. And um, yeah, we've really helped professionalize the, the camping in industry as far as staffing is concerned and have introduced um, international staffing to a number of day camps here as well, which has been pretty phenomenal. We've seen a lot of change. Interesting. Awesome. All right. So since, since you're, you're yapping, before you, um, before you get off there, I, I, I just want to so the first uh, area I want to talk about is, is counselors, right? Frontline counselors, right? And um, whether you start with high school kids or college kids, um, something that, Jonathan, you have a lot more experience in and are probably better at than, than the rest of the people that are hosting this podcast today is the whole staffing fairs, like camp staff fairs kind of thing, right? So my, my staff is planning to go to one tomorrow at a high school, and I, I, just, I dread the experience for those people. Um, and, and I've gone to them at colleges and such and talk about fishing in a big pond, right? <laughs> and mm -hmm. What kind of advice would you, do you give camp professionals for, um, for being at a, at, a, at a job fair, a staffing fair? You know, it's one thing, we're, we're all accustomed to going to camp fairs where there's a whole bunch of camps in there, right? But when you go to a job fair and then you got like law firms and banks and Target and FedEx and all these companies, you know, that are, by the, by the way, probably paying way more than your camp is. Um, ha, 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 any ideas that you can share? And you, are you referring to, like, ideas for uh, helping these people make the decision to come to your camp or giving them information about your camp or the screening piece? Well, uh, well how to present at, at these things. If you're a camp and you're going to be at a job fair, mm -hmm. rather than just yeah. sit, sitting at a table, yeah, right yeah. and standing there waiting for them to come to you like well sure. no, let's start with the pitch i mean that's something you just suggested yeah. like what is your pitch well I, I think that there's a few things for sure i mean one thing that we always recommend is not to sit behind the desk is to pull your table back stand in front present yourself um provide the participants these young staff are are looking for um some visuals so they want to see your camp online. A lot of them will have a phone. So if you have a card and you can provide a link to a website or a video that you can punch in really quick while you're talking to a lot of people, I recommend that. And they'll take it away and they'll look and they'll review it. 
Um, I also recommend that you bring some camp swag. So if you have any sweatwear or materials that you can hand out as promotional materials, I would give it to them. Everyone obviously loves that at the fairs. Um, and I, I would focus as much as you can on asking questions related to their childcare experience um, and trying to gather that as quickly as possible. Um, the, the most important thing though that I would say is that not to try to close the deal at the fairs. The fairs is an opportunity for you to develop as much interest as possible, gather as many names, as many emails as you can, and then following up with them in a personal follow-up for all the individuals that you meet that you think would be excellent candidates personally is so key because so few businesses do that. Um, mm -hmm. Let them know you don't want to make the decision right away, that you want them to take this very seriously, even if they're super eager to sign right there and then. Give them the opportunity to do the research on your camp, find out some more, and then don't do the hard sell, follow up later, give them the time and the attention, and you'll stand out further than any other organization out there. Yeah, There's I think that's a, that's, a, that. that's, a, that's a very good point about follow up. It is surprising um, how few uh, other companies follow up. So, so Mark and Ryan, when you're, um, when you're soliciting your, your younger end staff, right? Your high school, college age kids, right? And obviously, you know, if you can pull from within, right, and you can get people who went to camp, who understand, you know, the camp thing, that's one thing, right? But I'm talking about finding people out there who may have never been to camp and have no idea what you really do. What, what is your pitch to these folks to, to try to get them to, you know, consider your, your well, job as a summer job? Uh, you know, we don't really attend. I haven't really attended many of these job fairs. Well, forget about even, a job fair. A I mean, one on one, yeah. a one on one interview. Um, you know, I think um, we do get a lot. We do see a lot more applicants coming that really um, have no experience with camp, either as a camper, um, as a counselor, um, never went as a kid, um, and we're seeing more and more staff that you know are looking at us and us to a job at like a supermarket or in a restaurant and so you know i think we have to we, we try to emphasize the amount of fun they're going to have i try my, part of my pitch is with our, with our facility i think we have a beautiful campgrounds a beautiful facility if the weather permits it uh part of what we like to do is try to take them on a little walk let them see what they're going to do talk and walk a little bit get them out of the office make it seem like this is a little bit more engaging this isn't like, isn't like a stiff uh you know a stuffy job um, you know, tell them how this is a little bit, how this is going to um, benefit them as they move forward in whatever they want to do uh, for a career. You know, some of the uh, people skills they're going to develop, um, some of the, just some of the network they get, they're going to get out, out of an experience working at a camp like this. Um, but mostly I think if they're, if they're that age, if they're college age, we don't really hire younger, which is a different um, challenge for us by not hiring high school kids. Um, but mostly it's um, they can realize this is going to be a great uh, summer experience that they can remember for the rest of their lives. Mm -hmm. Ryan, what about you we, going, in, going into so Los Angeles? Yeah, so I think the market is a little different out here. I know for the camp side it is, for parents what they're considering. For us, kids come, you know, a couple days a week for, uh, in some cases, multiple weeks, not, you know, for the whole summer or um, every day necessarily. So that part's a little bit different as well. Uh, from a staffing side, uh, I think one of the biggest pieces that we're struggling, that we compete with is there's just so many options in such a small space. Um, and so it's a matter of really trying to stand out for them. So we've actually gone the opposite route. And, and there's different opinions on this out, out here about what the right answer is. Uh, some people are looking at their, their numbers and going, well, we have more staff who are starting the application and not completing it. So that must be the hurdle, the application. For us, we've kind of gone the opposite way and said, look, if you're not wanting to finish the application, you are not going to make it through the summer. We expect a lot out of you during the course of the summer. So we're not trying to make the, the, the process simpler. Uh, we're trying to engage them more throughout the process, but not make the process simpler. So we actually start with a group interview that they come to. And when we're trying to recruit them, um, after they submitted their application, this year we're introducing, we're sending them a packet of information that's a PDF they can view on their uh, phone, on their uh, tablet, on a computer. Computer, um, that is full color that's really geared towards them getting a visual idea of what camp is going to be like to try to 
help paint the picture of camp before they ever come to the group interview. Now we've gone much more specialized in where we're up, how we're recruiting people. So in the old days, we did a lot of print ads at local universities. Uh, students less and less are looking at those newspapers. So there's a few local places that the newspaper is still really big on campus. We do that, but we're doing much more on the online specific job boards um, that are particular to lifeguards or particular to um, uh, animal related or naturalists or things of that area to try to target different key areas. Um, we've also started having a staff person reach out to clubs at universities and engage the clubs directly that pertain to the types of fields that we're looking for to try to get the kids there as well and just to spark some interest in it. Um, some clubs, some schools are totally on board with it. Some we get nothing from and there's no interest, but it doesn't stop us from trying. So um, we've, we've tried to increase our pool in that way, but then uh, be really upfront and honest about our expectations and, and really try to help them understand like, this is a commitment, but you're going to get a lot out of it. And we really talk about, it doesn't matter if you're going to med medical school, law school, want to be a teacher, uh, it doesn't matter. You're going to learn skills here that'll benefit you in whatever field you're going into. And then we try to extrapolate that based on whatever field they want to go into. When you talked about the group interviews, um, do you do the group interviews in Los Angeles, like in the city? Right. Because we, that's we, no, we do those at our site. At oh, our yeah? site. We start in March and we'll go virtually every other weekend or so. And then we kind of look at when spring breaks are and we'll do some during when spring breaks fall. Um, they come to our site. We have a few people here who lead them, six to eight applicants per one interviewer. Um, there's three parts to it. I can go into that in more depth if you'd like. Uh, but we found that for a lot of people, that's really overwhelming. So the number of people who submit the application who don't come to the group interview because they're nervous about it, that keeps going up. And so I'd say it's about 50% of the people submitting applications now don't show up to the group interview. So that's what we're trying to reduce. We're trying to figure out what's, what's, the, what's causing them to give up and not right. come to that. Is it fear, anxiety? So that's what we want to draw. Uh, so I'm just going to throw out there that um, there's a lot of camps that solicit staff from Manhattan that are doing now, they're renting a room at a place in Manhattan and doing group interviews there to sort of cut through that first barrier of entry, right? That you're, that you're mentioning that, that fear of, 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 you know, hiking all the way up to your, your beautiful camp, which, you know, once you get there, it's right. great, right? But just getting them there in the first place is the hard spot. When you said um, job boards, right? Like, like online job boards. Like, what does that look like? Like, what, where do you find these things? Uh, it just doing, you can do so many Google searches for like, uh, pretend you're the staff person and mm -hmm. what you're looking for and what your interests are. And then you'll find these different, very specialized sites that exist that are for their interests that you can post on. Um, Barefoot student is great for folks who are um, like outdoorsy related uh, industries. Um, there's ones for lifeguards. There's all different ones out there. So just doing a, a web search helps you find them. Uh, we also um, own the domain daycampjobs.com. Sorry, everybody else. Um, but we have a uh, group out here that we advertise together um, that we're advertising different schools as day camp jobs, and then it helps direct them to the different camp space geograph geographically what makes sense for them too. Yeah, I, I for a period of time when I started Liberty Lake, I owned njcampjobs.com for the same sort of reason. Um, well, very interesting. And I like your advice, Ryan, that, you know, it seems such a simple thing, but yet I bet people don't really think about it. It's like pretend you're looking for the job. Right, go online and pretend you're looking and do some do some web searches. Um, you know, you you were you both mentioned like you know the sort of pitch like that we're that we're that we're giving to these people. Um, I, I saw I was at a leadership conference uh, about ten years ago. This guy he was talking about that famous uh, trip across Antarctica like a hundred years ago. This guy Shackleford Shackleton did gotcha. right. Right. And, and, um, and that he had to find people to do this, this trip. Right. And uh, because it, it was sort of um, the purpose of this was to explain that that maybe you should be realistic or even more daunting, you know, in your pitch because you want someone that's up for a challenge. Right. So I'm just I'm going to read to you from the actual help wanted um, ad that they that they put in like the London Times. Right. In like 1912 or whatever it says men wanted for hazardous journey, small wages, bitter cold long months of complete darkness, constant danger, safe return doubtful, honor and recognition in case of success. Contact Ernest Shackleton, right? And he got flooded with applications, right? So I just, I, I read that to you guys just to, to 
because we're always so worried about like sugarcoating the experience in a way. And, and the fact is, this is the most daunting job that these people will probably ever have in their life, right? The most challenging, yet the most rewarding, right? So that's sort of how I frame it, you know? I'm not so sure that the people looking at the ad would make it to the end of the ad today <laughs> to see the reward. <laughs> they would be on to the next one. It would be a much lower <laughs> percentage of people. I, I agree. Um, if, I can, uh, if I can jump in. Sure. Uh, just a thought, Andy, that you said, um, staff today are so uh, uh, visually connected that um, the way camps have existed for so long and how we've advertised for so long is, is just, it's really changing in that regard. So I think staff today are looking more and more, are there people there who look like me? Um, just as our campers mm. are feeling that sense of belonging. And so one of the things we're trying this year is we've gone through, we've recorded short video interviews of staff who have both been lifers as well as people who are brand new to camp and having them be honest about what it was like the first day and what it looked like and the things that we do to help them feel comfortable and help them connect to try to help overcome those barriers that they may be feeling. So trying to meet them where their anxiety is and then trying to help squash that as much as possible um, because that's what they're, that's, that's the world they live in now with Instagram and, and all the videos they're seeing all the time. It's, it's totally visual. So um, if you go through and look at your campsite, your staffing site, it may be too text-based. Uh, and so they're not reading everything that you want them to. So how do we shorten that, make it more tangible for them and digestible in, in shorter, smaller chunks? Yeah, yeah. If you go to Liberty Lake Day Camp, um, the website, and click, you know, for staff kind of thing, um, you'll see what you're talking about. I created these little vignettes, you know, to sort of take you along. Because I do agree that that's how, you know, you want to know how these young people think? Just think Instagram. That's how they think, right? In short snippets. Um, so Sam got a different kind of camp. Um, so Sam runs, um, it, it's, a, it's a recreation program, but a, you know, a big sizable one. And by the way, I, I've been versed by uh, uh, Dave Malter and, and, and others have told me who have gone out and, and, and spoken at these conferences out there in, in, in Illinois, how the rec departments really are a lot different than most rec departments in other states, right? Yeah. Because it's not, it, it, it's not the township, right, that's overseeing it. It's this what? What's it called? You report it's, to it's, who? own taxing body so we're not part of the city we're our own park district. right right the park own, district right yeah With, and they have pretty decent sized budgets as a result yes. of that yeah, so, so so what is your youngest staff person sam at your camp um 18 so um i guess the tidbit that i i would love to add is um i like to grow my own staff so having a structure where they can be a junior leader and then they can be a teen leader all the way through senior and high school where they're paying us to come still. Um, but we still have the connection with them all the way until they're old enough to be hired. Um, I also have the advantage of having a before and after school program where they can work that during their high school years and then switch over to camp. Um, so camp's kind of the, you know, the carrot at the end of the stick that they're shooting for. Um, and the other part of that too, I, I have about the same size as Ryan, about 350 kids a day, about 100 staff. Um, a lot of those are inclusion aides or at least 30 or so. Um, but I usually get about 300 applications. And part of that was years and years of slowly growing people, hanging onto your good people and having them invite their friends who are like themselves, not their drinking buddies, but their friends <laughs> who are, have the same values they do. And then it became its own animal where now it's cool to apply for camp. But that right. takes time. Yeah, well, and you know, for, if I'm a typical college kid, right, at, at any one of our, the, the folks that are on this call right now, like what is a typical college kid gonna make for eight weeks of camp at your camp? Like at my camp, it'll be between 2,500 and 3,000, which I know is way more than Long Island, right, Mark? Yeah, yeah, but again, you're comparing uh, the same age, like a 19, 20 year old? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, so yeah, I mean, we're, they're gonna make in, uh, in salary about a uh, college kid about 1,600 right mm -hmm. now. Um, and then they're going to get tips, which will take them, could take them uh, into the low twos. Maybe, maybe they'll get to 2,500. If they're a bus counselor, uh, you know, maybe they get over 3,000. Right. So it's not, it's not that far off, I guess. And, and Ryan Rosen, do you hire any high school kids or am I the only one on this call that hires 16? We, we have a, 
we have a camp internship program. We do not hire high school kids. So uh, mm -hmm. they can be graduates, uh, just graduate high school. We call those uh, co-counselors, uh, but that's the youngest that will go is they have to have graduated high school. Gotcha, gotcha. Um, yeah, because I think that the, you know, the cost benefit analysis going on in the heads of these young people who don't know what you do, right? They don't really know. Yeah, you're outside. It's pretty. You're in the mountains, blah, 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 right? I got car insurance. I have to pay. All right. Well, what, what's a gallon of gas cost in California, Ryan? I'm guessing way over $3 at this point, right? Three, $3.89. Oh my gosh. Uh -huh. yeah. Holy cannolis. Yes. I paid two fifty this morning, just so you know, in New Jersey, baby, um, where everything else is more expensive. But, um, <laughs> but we don't have toll roads, so, you know. <laughs> that's, that's, that's true. Uh, but I just think that um, for, for me, getting these young people, whether they're high school, where they make half as much as that, and then the college kids, that's my big obstacle is the salary thing because they're just comparing – they're comparing apples to watermelons. You know, they're not – but in their head, it's just a job you know, and that's what it very often comes down to for these folks. So in our, in our high school program, so it's SILT stands for Camp Internship for Leadership Training. Um, we've invested in our leadership team who are supporting them. So they're meeting with them regularly. And so they're leaving after four weeks with us with really tangible, specific things that they've seen growth in and development. Um, we have many of them come back year after year. Last year we had over 60 um, silts that were in our program um, and uh, they're technically campers. They small pay a small registration fee to be there, but it's a lot of uh, skill development that we're selling for them and to their families. And so um, it, it, they can be here with us for any one of uh, any two of our four rotations during the course of the summer. So it can work around some of their summer classes or vacations or things like that and still be here every day during that block of time. And, and they're with the same group for that extended time. So they're really building their skills. So it's really focused on that. And uh, like you said, we want to grow our own. So we were looking at how can we get our silts more prepared for when uh, they're ready to be staff. And then we can basically more than 50% of our staff um, every year either uh, former campers or former silts who are in our program. Got it. Yeah, growing your own is definitely a, a good investment. There's no doubt about it. Um, I, I just, uh, I see a lot of camps like Mark's that um, I know that there's like a break in the action. Like it's a lot of, like a lot of sleepaway camps. You get up to the certain age and then the next, the first year you could be hired or even be a silt kind of person, there's a break in the action and that makes it tougher for you. Would you agree, Mark? Yeah, we're, we're, we're trying to address that a little bit. We're trying to um, change what happens to uh, those 10th and 11th and 12th graders so that they might be more inclined to stay with us. Um, but they're really, I mean, it's, if you can grow your own, it's great. Um, no matter, we'll never get to a point where we can grow enough where we don't have to be extremely aggressive in terms of finding people to interview and to bring in to apply. And, you know, I think that's just a, a huge challenge. Those people who went to camp and understand camp, you know, they kind of get it. And we've always said that, you know, people who went to camp just get it and we don't need to uh, teach them what they're going to get out of the experience. And we've all had a hard time. The camping industry has had a hard time of, I think, explaining to people, who have never been to camp what the benefits of camp are so when you're meeting someone who has never been to camp never worked at camp and they're all of a sudden for some reason they're they saw your ad and they're applying it's you know we we have to do a better job of learning how to explain those benefits to them yeah well i think along the lines of what you're saying i think we need to do a better job of explaining the benefits to the people who are even at our camp right like the people of the pre-silt people ryan because you know what, what happens at, at these camps is that a lot of these kids even if they've been with you for 10 years is that they hit a certain age and their parents are successful people who are like okay time to start screwing around now now you got to get an internship or now you got to get a job in the field you want to work at or whatever all those kind of things and um, if you haven't spent time explaining the, um, the, com the competencies that they're learning as a camp person, you know, then you're sort of missing a boat while you have them as, a, as, a, as a, um, a captive audience. So what we do at our camp is we stress that when you're a, when you're a staff person, that yeah, you're gonna make some money, but more importantly, you're gonna be learning communication skills, leadership skills, critical thinking, collaboration, creativity, work ethic, these things 
that are the tangible skills that you're going to need when you're in college and you're going to need that, that your employers want. These are the skills employers want. They don't really care if you're a 4.0 student. They care that you can function and work hard and, and, and share information and work in a group with people, right? And there really is no better environment for that than camp. So, you know, even if you are a, an IT uh, major, right, and you're going to be sitting there, you know, working out software, you have to work with groups of people. Right. So, you know, and if people think you're a jerk, they're not going to want to work with you. And it doesn't matter how talented you are to a degree. So, yeah, education, I, I think, is important. I think what, we're, what we're learning going along with that is and we're trying to shift to is let our counselors teach other people what they get out of camp. Let the ones that have done it as opposed to us, the old guys and the ones who are the owners and the directors of the camp trying to tell other people, here's what you're going to get out of it. Learn it and, and hear it from someone who's experienced it and is more your peer and has nothing to gain from saying what's, mm -hmm. what, how they feel about it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, something to think about is bringing back some of your former, I mean, you've got a lineage, both of you guys have lineages there for generations, bringing back some of the people you know, to talk about, you know, what their experience, how the experience as a camp counselor has helped them. Have them talk to the middle school kids, you know, before they get up to that age. Um, I know we had Jonathan Gold on um, a few episodes ago, and he was talking about one of his former, um, one of his former campers uh, is now a CEO of a big company. He was interviewed in, in Inc. Magazine or Forbes Magazine, and they, they asked him, like, you know, about his experiences, you know, that, that helped him become the CEO he is. And he said, he said, being a counselor for a group of third grade boys was the most, you know, <laughs> toughest, the most challenging experience he had in his whole life, you know, that taught him the most about how, being resourceful, you know, and about managing people. I want to I take a, a turn now and talk about move up to the teachers, adults, right? When you're hiring that next level people, the people that are running activities or that are administrators, right? Um, <clears throat> how successful are you guys in getting these adults to work at your camp if they don't have kids in the camp program? We know that if they have kids in the program, that's one thing, right? But I'm talking about getting people on their merits, not on their child rearing. Well, it's Jonathan here. You know, one yeah. thing that, um, just to chime in on that, that we found really interesting with camps um, in Canada is that an additional benefit that they're adding on a lot of these day camps is overnight accommodations um, for a select number of their staff. And that can be a huge value add for more senior folks um, who want to be, you know, renting out their house in the city um, or wherever they're located um, and move out into the summer. Um, somewhere more rural potentially, or just a different venue. It also can attract a large number of international staff um, who are super eager to come over to the United States or Canada for not only for a camp experience, but for a cultural exchange experience. And those candidates might stay on for many, many years. They might not have the same pressures of internships that someone perhaps in, in North America might have. Um, and a lot of times the demands of those international staff for accommodations are fairly minor. We have camps who just, you know, put together some platform tents and uh, provide some um, restrooms and they're totally happy and totally fine with it. Um, and those staff end up sticking around for many, many years um, and they're very, and they're very happy. So I mean, it's one option to consider. We're seeing that trend here in Canada. Um, and just to go back in the salary piece, we have seen some camps try to extend on paying their staff a higher salary. And those camps have noticed that they actually, a lot of them end up saving money because they get higher quality staff and um, they don't have to hire as many staff um, to run their program. So that's something to think about as well, especially as you get you know, a few really good people, it uh, might make sense to sort of juice up their salary a little bit to keep them you know, further engaged and, and to compete with some of the other industries that might be trying to recruit them. Not, not to disagree um, with you, Jonathan, because I think every, every area is very different. Um, if we try to compete on salary here as the lure, we will lose every single time um, because it doesn't play as well, I think, for parents um, as camp does. So we try to really talk about, uh, equ solve the equation for them. If they're talking to their third grade boys about uh, talking them into playing soccer or whatever activity it is, 
that's a lot like giving a, a presentation, a corporate presentation. You're reading the room, you're seeing how they're responding, you're adjusting your pitch based on what they need. So we connect the dots for them and then explain that don't just put camp counselor on your resume. Um, talk about all the other things that you actually, life skills that you practice. Um, that's what is worthwhile to you. And we're going to coach you through that. So you meet with our leadership team member who's supporting you at least once a week, if not multiple times a week. And we're talking about your development just as much as your kids and activity wise. So we focus more on the skills and yeah, you're going to make a salary, but that's kind of the least important thing. Um, most of my leadership team, I think, will be back even if we paid them nothing because it's the impact that they're able to have. And that's what's really important to them far more than the salary. But that could be Los Angeles compared to Canadian camps. I gotcha. So, Mark, 400 staff. Uh -huh. where, where do you even start? Where do you even start with, with like casting nets? you know, for, 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 for folks. Well, obviously the starting point is to try to get as many of just like with campers is having a good return rate is, is very helpful in building your camp. So if you can get a good return rate from your staff, that's key. So, you know, just like most of us probably have our division heads calling campers from the prior summer who didn't re-enroll. We have our staff, including myself and other division heads calling and supervisors calling their staff, seeing what they're up to, are they coming back? Um, we uh, send letters out to our, our database as they reach an age where they could work for us. We um, mail all those kids letters as they get to that age, uh, usually around Christmas time. Just give them a nice letter with some memories of their experience here, invite them to come and apply. Um, and then we just, you know, started hitting a lot of advertising. I think, um, I think someone brought it up, maybe Ryan brought up, um, you know, um, you know, using new meat, you know, new modes of advertising to find staff. So, you know, we have Facebook ads running, Instagram ads, um, you know, Indeed, and just trying to get as much attention as we possibly can. Yeah, Instagram ads. Yeah, that, that's uh, that sounds decent, no doubt about it. Um, <clears throat> so when you're looking for administrators, when you're looking for people to be in charge, what what is the profile of these people that you're looking for? Well, the, be the benefit of having a large camp, because I heard the question before about finding the mature staff mm -hmm. and group leaders and, and teachers, is the benefit of having a large staff is I do have a lot of people ultimately to draw from when an administrator role opens up. And so we've been pretty lucky to not have to go outside and have to hire sort of what you would call like an unknown quantity um, to take on a position of a, with a, a lot of responsibility, right? Where mm -hmm. you don't want to be sort of embarrassed a week into the summer where you kind of take someone and you know what you got. Uh, so we're fortunate with that. Um, you know, we don't take too many um, we don't really look for parents. I know you brought that up too. People mm -hmm. who have kids who want just free tuition. Not really looking for that. Sometimes it comes along, but we don't really go around looking for that. Um, you know, for us, I think the, the difficult issues that we have with adults is probably what I'm sure everyone has in addition to other problems is, is certain talents are very hard to find. There are unique talents that are extremely hard to find. You know, ropes course leaders, you know, archery instructors, Gymnastics, specific talents become challenging. So, so when it comes to those kind of things, though, um, I mean, I could just talking for myself. Um, I I try to line up as many trainings as possible because I know that you know you don't have to be a super experienced person to be teaching a lot of these things you need certifications for. So if I can get them trained up, right? So I've sent people to boating courses, archery courses, ropes courses, rocketry courses, right? All those things. You know, as if you're a good teacher, you're a good teacher. That's the way I look at it. Right. Yeah, no, no, yeah, yeah. You know, we have had people go up for an archery course. Um, I, I don't know how it is in New Jersey. I, I assume it's probably the same course, but sometimes it's a whole weekend. They have to go up mm -hmm. upstate or something it's like a that. Commitment. It's yeah, a commitment. we've done it. We've done it. I'm not, and I'm also not the biggest fan of putting someone who's you know inexperienced just because they passed the course, you know, running archery. So, um, you know, archery is certainly unique compared to maybe some other activity areas, but when when you know, you're talking about safety, you know, it's, there's nothing I think that you, 
you can have a certificate or you can have a lot of experience and I'll take, I'd rather take the experience. Right. So it's right. something you need both. Right. No doubt. Um, <clears throat> but you know, I, I guess something I'm sort of alluding to is that you get a lot of teachers that come in that are looking for, you know, to be supervisory kind of positions. And um, just because you've been a supervisor of classes of 25 kids does not necessarily correlate to being a supervisor of, you know, of whatever, 16 to 25 year olds or your peers or whatever, or strong minded, capable people who are on their summer vacation that you're trying to make really work hard, right? Like managing people is a completely different uh, skill set, right? right? Which some people have and some people don't have. And, and I don't know how developable it is. It almost seems like it's a natural skill, yeah. right? I, I've had plenty of uh, school district staff panic when they're with the 100 kids and it, they're not sitting and they're not listening. And it's, it's not a similar situation at all. I, I agree with Mark hiring from within so that you know they've had some experience not only with your philosophy and your structure, um, but with camp as opposed to school. Yeah. All right. Any any last thoughts on recruiting? Anyone want to chime in on any last thoughts before we move on? I got one, I, I, one thing. Sorry, Ron. One, no, one quick thing. We got, we got time. We got is, time. I thought this was going to come up by someone is, you know, I think one of the biggest challenges, and I had it with, I just interviewed two people today where it came up, is just attendance. And mm. I think just getting people who can actually commit to a whole summer is becoming a really big challenge. And how do you you know, uh, you know, maintain a certain level of um, standard, but yet, you know, start to make some exceptions, which we, we have. That's been, I think, one of our biggest challenges. Yeah. Well, I think in general, more and more camps are just becoming more and more lenient. I mean, that's just what it comes down to. Um, I, I see more and more exceptions being made. And, you know, we used to be tough. This is something we we stumble upon in the day camp pod you know, pretty much every other episode, this topic comes up. Um, but I mean, it's just, it's, it's the world we live in now, you know, it's not as easy to get people for these prolonged periods of time. I mean, I don't know how sleepaway camps do it. I don't know how these full service, these full season sleepaway camps can get, you know, people for eight and a half weeks to go up to the mountains. Like that's admirable, you know, we've, uh, we have the same problem out here that you were describing Mark and, and it's, it's, definitely uh, a slippery slope once they experience it they're like oh well they did it so I can do it and I can push it a little farther and next thing you know you have these people coming and going so we've partially said that to be a group counselor you really need to be here for the majority of the summer if you have to miss a couple of days here or there it's one thing but um, being a rover or being in another position and having you have to miss some time we can accommodate that but if you want to be a group counselor you got to be here the, the nine weeks of our summer. Uh, we, we navigate out here um, university schedules where our state schools and uh, start the last, some case the last week of our program or the week right afterwards. And our uh, UC system ends the week of our staff orientation. So our kids are here for the nine weeks that is kind of this window of space um, that we can have it in. So we have to navigate when that happens uh, at the same time. Um, one thing that we started that we've done for a long time, and if camps are doing this, um, I, I'm shocked if we're the only ones. Um, the idea of uh, re-interviewing staff who want to be back for the following year, um, and we redo that with. I sit down with everybody usually during winter break or right after, where we're talking about, it, and they don't know if they want to come back or not. But to me, that's part of the advertising of they're starting to think about camp. They're going to talk to their friends where they're going um, and why they're interviewing uh, to come back for another summer. And during that time, we rehashed what went well, what didn't go well, what things would you go back and change? Um, what things did you learn last year? So we're really kind of bringing it back up to the surface now that they're removed from camp to talk about um, the things that they learned and gained from it. So as they're now having that next conversation, should I get an internship right at the top of their mind is what I learned and how I grew from my time at camp last summer. And maybe it's worth it to go back for another summer because of that so that's part of in my mind our recruitment strategy is is helping to repaint that picture for them now that they're um have been removed from it and they're not as exhausted from the last day of camp right and of course ryan's got 75 staff it's a little easier to do when you as opposed to hundreds of staff but for a camp that has hundreds of staff um i do what ryan's outlining but i just i do it with like a hand pick the ones i do 
instead of just making it mandatory for everybody. Um, and they are awesome conversations when it's the off season and there's no stress, you know, going on. You can really talk about things and debrief stuff really nicely. All right, folks, it is time for the day camp tip of the week. So get ready because Sam Thompson is going first, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> what you got? All right, I'm kind of sticking with my painting thing going on here. Um, bubble painting. So you take um, some non-toxic paint and put a little Dawn dishwashing liquid in it or any, any brand, but you get the picture. And then you give the kids a straw and you explain to them and have them practice blowing on the straw, not sucking. <laughs> and you go through that drill several times before you let this, them do this. And then they put their straw in the paint and they blow bubbles and you take a piece of paper, put it on top of what they've blown, the bubbles pop and make a really pretty picture. The only downfall is if they suck in the paint, they'll have a mouthful of blue paint. So, um, you right, really so, so yeah, so you don't, you get the water-based paint. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I, I think you need to put together a little book of, of bubbles and paint and, and stuff. Just call it that and sell it at ACA National, the bookstore. Because at this point, you've got a lot of people listening to these ideas. <laughs> Phenomenal. All right. I, I'm going to throw out one, a staff one. Um, when, I was, uh, when I visited Banner Day Camp um, back in, you know, I don't know, 10, 20 years ago, um, they were telling me how they were able to, and you know, if you, if you give the information up front to your staff and they know the expectations, um, and they had a big staff, you know, hundreds of people that I think it was like every Wednesday, the staff came back kind of thing. And they had a staff meeting like every Wednesday from like six to eight. And it became this very communal kind of nice thing. Um, I don't, I just think I'm, my camp's too logistically, uh, hard to do that kind of thing. It's difficult, challenging. Uh, plus I have a lot of staff with, with second jobs and such like that. Um, but I do, I did take from that and to do a mid season evening staff training um, that I do the third week of camp and where I make it mandatory and they all know about it. Um, and, and they come back and, you know, we have food for them. We usually have some sort of keynote speaker kind of person, give them a little inspirational talk for a little bit. And then they break up into their divisions. And even if they just sit in circles and talk about what's going well, and what, you know, what are they having trouble with kind of thing. And just have that time because the day camp day is just so fast moving and so tough and it's so hard to have these calm conversations, you know, um, to be able to really debrief things. And not a venting session, not a, not a time for them to just complain about certain kids that are really tough and that kind of thing, but to be constructive. Um, and the staff, you know, 99% of the staff leave from that night feeling really a lot better about things, you know, knowing that they've been heard, that they've had a forum to voice their concerns and all. Um, yeah, so I recommend it highly. You know, you gotta put it in their paperwork though. They just have to do them way early and let them block out that day and that is a mandatory day, just like a day of camp kind of thing, you know? And um, yeah, so that's that. If, all you, right. if you can do those uh, weekly staff meetings like that, we do that still and it's fabulous. They go out to dinner afterwards together. It's bonding time for them. Um, but each week we have a different theme and, and we break up at different types of groups. So there's small quorums to talk through it. Um, my, uh, my tip of the week are, uh, is, is really, I'm not usually someone who has a beard. Um, every four years when there's an election, <laughs> uh, we grow, uh, I grow a beard. And uh, the idea here is that uh, halfway through the summer, someone will stand up and say, I think you should uh, shave your beard. And someone else says, why? Um, why? He should be able to do what he wants. Um, ultimately, the goal is uh, that the kids start talking about it. And, and what, we're allowed to, what we're able to teach the kids is that they can disagree with other kids in their group. Um, they're talking about it. They have to listen to each other. The counselors are facilitating these kind of conversations that we, all, we can still respect each other and have different opinions about things. At the end of the day, we set up little voting booths and um, they have have little stickers I voted um, but at the end of the day it's really about them learning how to communicate with each other more effectively um, they also get to decide if I shave my beard which always wins so half my beard goes away and I've half a beard uh, for 24 hours which is always exciting um, but last year the oldest girls um, or four years ago campaigned for diet pink and so I had a pink beard for uh, 24 hours that then was shaved in half. And um, they, they, it was a thrill that they got to be in control of what I did. But also, um, it was great for the oldest girls to see, like, if they put their minds to something, they can accomplish it and uh, that their voice matters. So it's a really cool uh, little thing exercise we do every four years. So the kids don't even remember that that's why we do it, uh, that it's tied to election years. We just know it's tied to election years. So 
that's awesome, Ryan. Really, that is awesome. And uh, for those of you that didn't listen to our last episode, um, I described my campaign uh, thing I do with my kids, which is a, a similar kind of voting thing, you know, without without political parties. All right, Mr. Hammerdinger. All right. So uh, since it's the tip of the week um, and it's staffing, I thought um, we do something called the stars of the week. Um, and it works well with the evening meetings because about what it, well, however long it was, eight or nine years ago when my partner Mark and I uh, took over the camp, I had been here a long time, but when we took it over, we started bringing in evening meetings similar to what you talked about, Andy. We do two uh, during the summer and they start around six. So it's like after the buses are all done, the bus counselors come back and nobody really wants to come. But in the end, they enjoy, I think they do enjoy the time and they do similar to what you said. They sit with their division. They get to talk to their group leader and their co-counselors. Sometimes they work some things out. Um, you know, the division heads get to chat. We get to touch base with some people we, that we might want to touch base with. But the stars of the week is a way to build some excitement, especially at the first meeting when they come back, because it's usually around the second week of the summer. And it started with, I think, back when the Giants were good. <laughs> um, and there was like this thing where, you know, their, their chant was all in, I think, all in or something like that. Um, uh, so we did it during orientation. Everybody got like a poker chip and the theme was like all in and, you know, you know, don't give us, give us back your chip when you're a hundred percent committed and you're all in, you know, you're all in for the summer. So they gave us back the chip and then the supervisors picked, you know, some of the chips of their top performers that week and they went into a bag and we pulled them out at the staff meeting and they got a you know monetary prize i think we were giving out 50s you know nice crisp 50s fresh from the bank and it was done in front of the whole staff at that at that meeting so it was it created like an excitement so when they come back to that meeting the first one and then the one later in the summer they know that's going to happen we do it a few other times during the summer uh we do it at the last staff party there we give out a lot of money but it's just exciting and it's, it's a fun time. Awesome. Um, Jonathan, you still there? I'm still here. Can you hear me okay? We, yes, we need a Canadian representation it's, of our camp. It's going like crazy here. <laughs> <laughs> Even if it's not, it's just a good visual. <laughs> um, you know, we, we also run up here family camps, grandparent, grandchild camps, um, and we also help out with these day camps quite a bit. One program that seems to be hitting really well when you're trying to bring in staff, uh, younger day camp campers, as well as parents together, um, it's, it's, it's very basic, but it seems to really work well. It's themed bingo. Um, it's becoming big here. Uh, we do a disco bingo program, and the kids and the parents go nuts over it. They all get dressed up. So if you're able to bring the families together for a night or an afternoon at your camp. Theme bingo, um, and when someone gets bingo, we turn off the lights, the disco music goes on, we create a soul train, um, we throw around some beads, uh, and, and everybody goes crazy for it. I don't, something about dressing up and the parents let loose, um, but it works really well. Very basic, but it seems to work great. There you go. Awesome, as a bridge between yours and, uh, and Mark's, um, our second evening staff thing annually is a is an awesome like buffet dinner because it's, it's towards the end of the summer so we want to make them feel good and then we do a bingo night um, with different themes and such and I have to say bingo for adults is underrated you don't have to be a senior citizen to love yeah. bingo. what you need is a, what, you, what you need is a good bingo caller that's the key Huge. right we happen to have one on staff but people love it and especially these young people who are not used to playing things that don't have screens like bingo is a really awesome old school game and they get so into it. The high school and college kids get more into it than the adults. I think. Cause it's, it's just making like a mass. It's making a massive comeback. It is. It is. I'm all about bingo. I, I, I endorse tremendously. All right. Well, anyway, Jonathan camp Canada is it camp Canada.ca. I'm guessing. Yeah. Camp Canada.ca. You got it. All right. So check it out for international staffing, especially if you're North of the border there, Ryan Rosen, from I learned how to pronounce this camp today. It's Canaret. <laughs> Who would know? Got but, it. Uh, <laughs> yeah. It's campcanaret.com.org. What is it? Campcanaret.com. 
All right, check it out. And, and guys, I hope you notice like from Ryan's, he's such a thoughtful, awesome guy. And he does some really, really cool stuff. And, it, and, it, and he puts it all out there on the Camp Canaret website. So check it out and, uh, and email if you got any questions. He's a, he's a big time share. I met him at ACA National. Um, and then Mark Hemmerdinger from Crestwood Country Day Camp. Um, that's uh, CrestwoodCountryDayCamp.com. Is that it? CrestwoodCountryDay.com. Always Country a pleasure, Day. Andy. Oh man, it's it's, it's, it's awesome to have you on here. Mark is a uh, a fellow Mets fan, so we commiserate Suffer. together. Yep, that's what we do. All right, so we want to thank our Go Camp Pro executive producer Travis Salson, our producer Matt Hansberger, our dedicated sponsors ACA New York, New Jersey Commercial Recreation Specialists, and AM Skyer for allowing us to bring this podcast to you. And of course, my co-host today, Sam Thompson, um, from Crystal Lake Park District out there in Illinois. Um, if you don't want to miss an episode of Day Camp Pod, you should just subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, SoundCloud, or Google. Give us a nice rating while you're at it. And check out our show notes from this and other episodes at daycamppodcast.com. And feel free to send us some feedback and new, ICAS, new ideas for future pods at our email, daycampquestions at gocamp.pro. Thanks for listening and making yourself a better day camp professional. We'll be back in two weeks with another episode of the Day Camp Pod.